I'm going to pass around some pictures for you and um, some CDs. I just, what I really want to tell you is that I really treasure these pictures, so please don't keep them. Okay, I've had people keep them. I really treasure these pictures. I don't have copies. It's not stored in my computer. This is old school pictures. Look, this is a Polaroid. You know what I mean? Please, please, please pass them around, but please give them back to me. And if you so badly want a picture, a copy, I will make you a copy. Getting, okay, so, so getting back to your question. So, that's Josh Duhamel. He's an actor. Oh my gosh, he looks like one of my friends. He used to be on All My Children, and then he was on a show called Las Vegas. And um, he's doing something now on TV, but I forget the name of the show. Oh, I know him. So, getting back to your question. So one day my brother and I came home, and we were like, "Yo, ma, what you got? What we got for dinner?" And she was like, "Excuse me, what?" She's like, what, what, what did you call me? I said, Ma. She said, you don't call me Ma, you call me Yo Ma. I ain't Yo. She did that, you know, you know when they get serious on you, right? And the biggest thing she said to me that day, and I never forgot it. She said, when you're out there in the street, and you're around people, and you have to fit in, and you have to adjust how you speak, that's fine. But at home, you speak properly. And she said, we're not going to be here forever. That was the number one thing my mother used to say. Don't get used to it. We're not these people. We're not going to be here forever. And even though I think that thinking in your mind that you're superior to people can hurt you, but I think that in that circumstance, my mother was so determined in her mind to get us out of that environment that I really admire her for telling me that, for her saying, you're not like these people. You're not going to end up on drugs. You're not going to end up with five children. You are going to make something of yourself. And she believed in it so strongly that I never, I just, the way she said, I never forgot, I never forgot it. And I really, my mother is my hero in my life. And I really love her. And I really think that when I told her I wanted to be a singer, she didn't laugh at me. She said, okay, go for it. And I would cry and I would say, but Ma, I can't make it famous. Nobody would listen to me. And I would cry and cry and cry. And she would say, oh my God, would you please? Here, have some Fruity Pebbles. Just stop it. You're going to be fine. She'd be like, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. So she was really, really, really strong. And watching her you know, raise five of us by herself, it was really, really hard. But I really, really admire her courage and I admire her strength. And I admire the courage that she had to leave the abusive situation. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, no, but I'll let her go first. Yeah. You met him? Oh. Yes, I did. He's a really great guy. Who's that? The Rock. He's really hot. He's hot. Oh, my God. Mark. So, any other questions? Oh, you had a question. Yes. Um, did your family come to your shows? Did my family come to my shows? In the beginning, no, they didn't. Excuse me. In the beginning, I did everything on my own. And I didn't have a car. And I was working at a Twin Donut, which is like a ghetto version of Dunkin' Donuts. I worked there since I was 14. And then before school, I used to work at the breakfast program to pay my tuition. So I had two jobs. I was only 14. But because I looked older, I got away with it. But that's a whole other story. But um, I forgot your question. Oh, but did their family come to the shows? Okay, so in the beginning, I took myself everywhere. I took the money from work, and I would go on the bus. I would walk, things like that. It wasn't until I really started doing really, 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 really well. When I started to do arenas and things like that, that's when my mom was like, you're performing where? It's like Nassau Coliseum, Mom. Isn't that like a big like stadium thing? I was like, yeah. And, oh, okay. And then she was like, y you think I could go? So little by little. At the Madison Square Garden show, I bought, uh, I, I hired two limos to take my mother and my father to the show. I brought my brothers, my sister, because I wanted them all to be there, because that was a really big day for me. But for the most part, they really don't. They don't come to my shows. I have, um, in the last 12 years, my family has converted to born again Christian, and they're a lot more conservative, so because of their religious beliefs, they don't always come to my shows. They see club singing sometimes as a bad thing. Um, oh I don't. I'm not like stripping or, you know, <laughs> not pole dancing or anything like that. So I, I think I'm doing okay. And for the most part, all my songs are po are positive songs. Any other questions? I can't believe you. Yes, Mr. Munoz. I have a question. 
Um, we have a couple of artists. Well, two things. One, I have a student here who knows you do the freestyle on Sundays. Well, we don't do freestyle anymore. I'm just regular format now. The, regular format. the freestyle show has been discontinued for the last three years. Really? Yeah. So then I, but you do rotate freestyle right now, right? Because I, oh my God. They might play one or two songs okay, an hour. It's, it's, on I'm on Sundays now from 3 to 8 p.m. One of the one of the students had asked to give us a shout out on the air. Like, yep. Really cool. On Sunday. Oh, on Sunday, definitely. And I do have a I do have a website, it's JudyTorres.com. I am on Facebook. It's Facebook.com slash Judy Torres Music. And I'm on Twitter at Judy Torres Music also. Uh -huh. So if you don't know who I am, you're free to look at all that stuff. My bio's there, samples of songs are there, videos are there. I'm all over YouTube without people's permission. Nobody asked me, they just taped me and put it up there. Some stuff I wish was never put up, but other stuff it's okay. All right, two questions, the other two questions. One, um, when you're performing, I did see a YouTube clip of you at Webster Ball Game, mm -hmm. and there was this lady right in the front row, and I'm thinking to myself, you have a show, you have Judy Torres in front of you, and you're on your phone. Oh and she's on her phone the entire time. Do you notice that when you're singing? Do yes. You want to there is always someone in the audience. Well, nowadays everybody brings their phone. So you're performing and instead of, you know, when I first started, everyone would be like this. And sometimes someone would have a camera with the flash, with the old fashioned flash, right? But now because cameras are on phones, everyone's just standing there like this. And it kind of bothers me a little bit because I feel like just watch the show. I'm up here dancing, singing for you, kicking my butt for you. Can you please pay attention? But I understand that people, they want it for their memories. They, you know, they, as long as they, I guess as long as they value it, I guess it's okay. But it's, it's ironic. And it's ironic that there's always one person in the front and they're always looking at me like this. <laughs> it's always in the first row. Always in the first row. But you, you know, people will talk while you're singing. People will, uh, I've had things thrown at me in the beginning of my career. I had quarters thrown at me. Uh, one time I performed in a club called The Tunnel. And uh, someone actually threw a, a wrapped condom and it hit my eye. Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty. Yeah. So I've had things thrown at me. I've had I've had people say stupid things. Just last week, I performed in Miami, and um, this girl was like, "Judy, Judy." She, her hand is out like this. So you know, usually I acknowledge someone if their hand is out. I'll I'll take their hand, and I I, I gave her my hand, and she literally yanked me, and that had never in my 20-something years. No one's ever, I've never felt unsafe. I'm not exactly like a sex symbol or anything, so I don't have to worry about that stuff. And it was the first time I, I literally, she literally almost, I really almost fell right off the stage. And the bouncers were, were like pulling her off and she wouldn't let go of me. I don't know what her deal was, but it was scary. But you always have people that don't give you the respect that you want. And you just have to keep on going. You have to remind yourself why you're there. And sometimes I will find one person who's like this. <laughs> and singing like every single word. Sometimes if I feel slightly awkward or uncomfortable, I will look for that one person because that one person, you know, makes me feel comfortable and that will get me through it. You know, people tell you when you sing, sing to the back, you know, look at the exit sign, don't look at the people. My music teacher told me never do that. My music teacher said, when you walk into a room, look at your room. Look at every single person who's in the room. Feel them out. What do they like? What do they not like? So as soon as I get to a club, the first thing my question is, what are the people like? What's the nationality? What's the age group? Because then I can know whether I'm saying, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, or I'm saying, yo, what's up? How you doing? How's everybody feeling? It depends on the situation. But I think that that was one of the best pieces of advice my music teacher gave me. Feel the room out. And I think that even if you're not a singer, whatever you end up doing for a living, whatever you do in school, whatever you're pursuing, feel the room. Don't be afraid to look at people's eyes and acknowledge them. Because the truth is that people are very uncomfortable with eye contact. Especially nowadays, everyone's like this. So, eye contact is very, very important. Here. Any other questions? Here. Um, as a big woman, what hardships did you go through getting into the music business? When, when, uh, when I first tried to get into the music business, the first thing they said was, you know you have to lose weight. There's nowhere in the world they're going to sign you being fat. 
They were just harsh like that. I still have that problem going on. My manager and I fight about my weight all the time. And you know, the truth is, I have Oprah-itis. You know what Oprah-itis is? You know how Oprah goes up and down? That's what I do, I go up and down. I've never really been thin. I think I was, I think I was a size 12 once for like three weeks. And I was killing myself. I, I was starving myself. I was in the gym six days a week. I was in the gym for three hours a day. I was killing myself. I think part of me is naturally big. You know, I'm glad my father's tall. I'm glad I'm tall. At least I have that going. But I, I, w I couldn't understand why they said you, they're not going to sign you if you're fat. Because I just felt like I'm trying to be a singer, not a fashion model. <laughs> you know, I'm not trying to compete in a beauty pageant. I'm trying to be a singer. All I want to do is sing. All I want to do is inspire people. So that's always been an issue. And even in my love life, it's been an issue. I've gotten that, you know, baby, I will fall so much in love with you, you just lose 20 pounds. <laughs> and I got that, you got a beautiful face. That's it? <laughs> I'm just a face. <laughs> you got such a beautiful face to this day still. You got such a beautiful face, mama. Now, it, granted, it is a compliment. It is a compliment for someone to tell you you have a beautiful face because let's face it, we look at people's face. That's the first thing we look at, right? We really don't look at much else unless your guys and your hormones are going crazy. You look at other things. But for the most part, right, you look at the face. You look at the eyes. So if someone tells you that, it is a compliment, but it just made, it started making me feel like, so as long as I have a pretty face, I can get away with it. You know, it's like you look at Adele. Adele is a chunky girl. And she's a beautiful girl. Why do they say she has a beautiful face? Why can't they just say she's beautiful? It's okay that if you don't like people, you're not attracted to someone who's larger, that's fine. But why can't you just say she's beautiful? You know? So I've always had that problem. And uh, just my man, just, the, just recently, a few months ago, I had a meeting with my manager. And I sat down with him and he, we talked, we had a really great meeting. And right after the meeting, I had an audition for a movie. And so I was pretty excited, I was pretty nervous. And he said to me at the end of the meeting, so what are we gonna, aha! <laughs> okay. So he said, he said, so what are we going to do about this? And he made this big circle around my body. And I said, what do, what do you mean? He's like, Judy, you gained weight. And I said, whoa, first of all, I'm still 25 pounds less than when you met me. When I first signed with you, I told you, you are getting a Puerto Rican Cuban Queen Latifah. That's what you're getting. <laughs> Don't ask me to lose weight. Don't ask me to lose weight. If I lose weight, I lose weight from me. Not for you, not for anybody else. Because that pressure to look perfect, that pressure to be perfect, and just to work to satisfy other people, it's not good. You know, do I need to lose weight for my health? Absolutely. But I can't do it just because he's telling me to do it. So I'm kind of like a little rebellious in that way. So I'll go to the gym, like I do Zumba. Actually, I work out here in Hoboken. And I take Zumba classes. I'm in Zumba classes five, six times a week. And then I go home and if I feel like having a piece of cake, I have a piece of cake. <laughs> is it the right thing? Probably not. But the, the matter is that there are people in this world of all sizes. And to me, I represent the large woman. And if I can't make it, and if I can't show you that I can still be a singer or an actress or I could be on the radio, then I'm not doing my job. Because for me, that's what I represent. I want to be a role model for large women. I want to be a role model for women. I want to be a role model for Hispanics. So that's what I'm trying to do. Love me or leave me. Yes. Um, what is it like to be, like, I understand you are pressured because of like the differences like that people want you to change. What's it like to be pressured on a much larger scale, like with multiple, like some like hundreds to thousands of people wanting you to change? What's what's that like? When I when I first started performing, I would get on stage, and uh, this was probably within the first two or three years I was performing. Mm -hmm. And I would perform for really large crowds. I would do like um, festivals and things like that where there'd be thousands of people. And they would start chanting, go Gorda, go Gorda. And I would be like, <gasps> and years ago when I first started, I didn't really know Spanish, so I, I didn't know what they were doing. So I was confused, what is that? You know. So I asked somebody and they told me, and I, I was devastated. And I used to come off stage and I used to cry a lot. And I never let people see me cry, but I cried a lot. 
And then one day, um, I performed at the um, Queens, in Queens. What's that big park where they do World's Fair, Marina? The, the yeah, it's a, it's a big park in Queens, and there were thousands of people. It was a big festival. And I started performing, and they started doing the chanting thing again, and I was like, my God, everywhere I go, this is what they do to me. And I, I couldn't understand why they were making fun of me. So I went off stage, and I ran, yeah. and I went to a bench, and I sat, and I cried. I needed to let it out, because I was always holding it in. So I sat down, I was crying, crying, crying. This very tall African-American guy walks by me, and he's like, yeah, baby, that's how I like them, nice and thick. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. <laughs> and I was so pissed off at that time. I just, I thought, I, I, I swear, I thought I was going to kill him. <laughs> and he said, that's how I like them, chunky but funky. Mm. I'm chunky but funky, what the heck is that? <laughs> and I went, what is that, what, what? And he walked away, and he was like, okay, calm down, God. So he walked away, and I thought about it a lot. I did a lot of thinking, actually. And then um, a week later, I performed at a club called the Palladium. And the Palladium was the place to perform in New York. And it held up to 5,000 people. And I was performing there, and Hot 103, which is now Hot 97, was having a big party, and they were having a, um, an award ceremony. And I was nominated for Best Female Performer. So I invited, it was one of the few times my mother and my father came to a show. So they came to the show, and I started singing, and they started that chant again. And I got really upset. I was more upset that my parents were in the audience. Like, wh how can you do that to me? My, my family's here. So I stopped the show. I said, please stop the music. Stop it. So I stopped the music, and I said, when I get up in the morning, I see myself first. When I wake up in the morning, I look in the mirror. I see exactly what you see. But this is who I am, and this is what I have to live with. You know, I said, I'm here to entertain you. If you don't like my entertainment, if you don't like my performance, walk away. And I want you want to know one thing. I may be chunky, but I'm funky. And the crowd <laughs> laughed. They went crazy. They applauded. And I'm kind of famous for saying that now. <laughs> and um, that was it. That was the end of it. They stopped. They stopped throwing things. They stopped making fun of me. To this day, I don't have that anymore. And if someone says something, the people in the audience practically murder them. <laughs> so I don't even have to defend myself. Ooh. I thought about it for a while. I don't think they stopped because I stood up to them. I think they stopped because I decided that it was okay that I was like this. I think all that time, I think they sensed in the beginning. You know when you watch American Idol when they're auditioning? Mm -hmm. And you know when you see people audition and you know they're terrified? Yeah. yeah. I think that's what they saw on my face. I think they saw uneasiness. I think, you know, you can look at a person, you know when they're uncomfortable in their own skin. And I think that's what they saw and I think that's why they made fun of me. So the day that I did that, it was like saying, I accept me for me. And it helped. So it really hurt. I mean, it was like the first two years. I cried a lot, a lot, because I couldn't understand why they made fun of me. My attitude was, I don't make fun out of anybody. Why are they making fun out of me? So, but I'm really happy that I overcame that. And I still have issues. You know, you get up in the, in the morning to get dressed, and you go, oh, God, look at this. And you, you pick on yourself. And I, so I have days still. Just actually before I came here, I was packing, because I have a show in Chicago tomorrow. And so I was packing for Chicago. And I was like, oh, my God, look at this outfit. It looks horrible. I'm so fat. But then I have to stop myself. And I have to say, you know what? People are coming tomorrow to see me perform. They want to see a good show. So I'm going to look the best I can, and I'm just going to sing my butt off. And that's it. And that's how I get through it. Anyone else? Yes. How many famous people have you met? How many famous people have I met? Basically everyone you've seen in the pictures. Uh, Janet Jackson, Ricky Martin. Oh my God, Ricky Martin. Um, The Rock, uh, NSYNC, Backstreet Boys, John Leguizamo, Shaquille O'Neal, Mark Anthony, Jennifer Lopez, um, Freddie Krueger, Robert England. There have been a, there's been a lot of people. There's a lot of people. And you know, no Yankees. But I did perform with Tito Puente before he he uh, passed. And I performed with Tito Nieves. Tito Nieves 
guys actually liked my show and, and I couldn't believe when he complimented me. It was very sweet. Yeah. I really, I only had, I had one problem with one celebrity once. He was, a, he was kind of racist. Um, I'm not going to say the name. But it was awkward. It was weird. I, I was surprised. And it was because I was Hispanic. It was because I was Hispanic. He, he called me a burnt out version of Lisa Lisa or something like that. It was very weird. But it's okay. You know? Not everyone's going to like you. That's just the bottom line. Not everybody's going to like you. I don't care how hard you try. It's a very rare situation that everybody likes you. Very hard. And this business is about liking me. You know? When you said that um, your mom and your dad and your seven were you and your dad still close? My dad and I had a very, very strained, awkward, horrible relationship for many years. Um, I would wait for him to come visit me, and he would take, pick me up and my brother. He would take us to McDonald's, and then he would bring us right back home. Like, I couldn't understand, like, why doesn't he take us for the day? or to spend the night or, you know, and then there were times that I would stay there with my brother and he wouldn't show. And he wouldn't call to say he wasn't showing up. So for a lot of my life I had a very deep uh, hole in my heart for a father. I didn't have a father. And then my mother did, um, I did have a stepfather. She was with him for seven years and he was an alcoholic and he was highly abusive, highly abusive. I'm talking like every Friday night I knew when he came to the door that someone was going to get hurt, you know, and uh, it was almost always my mother. And finally, one day, I had had it, it was Christmas, and he came home drunk, and he ruined Christmas. I never had a ruined Christmas before, he ruined it. And I was so upset. And he started to pick up my mom, and he locked her in the bedroom, and he had never locked the door before. So when he locked in the bedroom, I flipped out and I got a butter knife and I picked the lock and I got in and I was like 12 or 13, maybe 14. And I said, that's it, I'm done, I've had it. You know, if you're gonna hit her, you hit me first then. And he, he went, <laughs> really? And I will never forget, with one finger, he went like that to my chest and I, know I flew across the room. And that was what my mother needed. It was the thing that woke my mother up. My mother's, oh! That was it. She was like, you don't touch my kids. So it was weird how she allowed it to happen to her, but not her children, you know. But that was the time that woke her up. So for a really long, long, long time, I really, I, I just wanted a father so bad. And that's why the first guy that said he loved me, I believed it, even though he didn't. And I made a really big mess of my life in the very beginning. But I did a lot of therapy. <laughs> I did a lot of therapy. I did have, a, when I was 23, I did attempt suicide once. And I lived through that. And it was through the therapy that I learned that it was the fact that I didn't have that relationship with my father that was really killing me, it was really hurting me, and I needed to face him. So I wrote him like a 12-page letter. I mailed it, and I was terrified. And he never really acknowledged the truth. He never really said, yes, you know, this happened, yes, that happened. But he did say to me, I love you. And someone told me once that was, that was really important that I, I can sh share with you for sure. Someone said to me, some people just don't have the skills to love. Some people are highly deficient in that category. You know, some people don't socialize, some people don't hang out, they don't know how to talk and stuff. Some people just don't have those skills. And that helped me a lot. And when I found out that my father had been severely abused, not that it makes it okay, but it made me understand him. And so now I could say I have a good relationship with him. It's not perfect, and sometimes he drives me crazy. But we talk, and I accept that back then, he just didn't know any better. He just didn't know any better. So, um, my sister passed away uh, in this past July. I had one of my sisters pass, and he wasn't speaking to her when she passed. And so, I spoke to him, and I spoke to her, my, my other sister, and I said, you guys have to fix this. You know, Grace's death is God's way of saying, life is short, fix this. So thankfully, they got together, they hashed it out. Like I said, it's not perfect, but 
at least they're all speaking together again. So I, I, I came from a very volatile, very uh, scary place. My mom was wonderful, but she was in survival mode. You know, my mom was about how do I make sure this guy doesn't get violent? So a lot of times she couldn't be emotionally present, but she really was a wonderful woman and she really did encourage me. And I did get skipped uh, from sixth grade. I, I, did, I saw sixth grade for one day and I got skipped the next day. And when I wanted to quit, my mother was like, okay, she did that reverse psychology. Okay, fine, you wanna go back to sixth grade, you wanna quit, that's okay, no problem. But she encouraged me and um, I, really, I really give her a lot of credit. And we've, we've talked about what happened and why, you know, when you come from that environment, everything is a secret.